So firstly, after the Midget Submarine video, a friend of mine reached out to offer a little bit of help in better pronunci pr pronunciating? Oh, crying out, it must be late. Pronouncing um, Japanese names. So in aid of that, this is not a Kai Ten. this is a Kaiten. Very different. You can't, can't put the space between the two. So, uh, and again, I'm sure he'll crucify me if I get it wrong this time. Kaiten. Um, the difference being that in Japanese, the two separate words, if you separate them, mean completely different things, and uh, you're saying something completely different. Small, small but vital difference. And this wonderful thing, the regular issue Japanese midget submarine, is Kohyoteki Kogata. Um, that's the actual submarine itself, and the Kogata is the type A, um, and it comes in Otsugata, Heigata, and Teigata, which is the type B, type C, and type D. Uh, also known as Teki or To, which is the Japanese nicknames for targets or tubes, for obvious reasons, given the shape. So, now that that is hopefully cleared up, and hopefully I haven't completely stuffed up what we spent about half an hour to 45 minutes actually talking about, um, let's get on with the rest of the questions. Dave Peachy asks, in the UK, and specifically between the late 19th and mid 20th centuries, to what extent did shipyards influence the designs of the vessels they tended for and or were tasked to build? With a supplementary question that which UK shipyards, if any, specialised in building which types of vessels? So it varied f quite extensively over that time period. Towards the end, it was less so because the Admiralty would prepare designs in great detail and then say to the shipyards, I want you to build this. Um, but in the early part in sort of the early part of the period you specify so late 19th century going into the early 20th to a degree there was quite a bit of influence in certain aspects um, i mean during the transition from first and second gen dreadnoughts over to super dreadnoughts um, when the admiralty was sort of tooling around looking for ideas as to what they were going to make their next uh, battleship into you had things like vickers armstrong turning up practically everywhere offering ships with their 14-inch gun. Um, the 14-inch gun that would go into a number of export designs up, including the Japanese, Congo, Fuso, and Issei classes. Um, but those those Vickers salesmen, they were literally everywhere. You could be sitting down to dinner and you'd have a sale, you, could, you could have a salesman pop out from under your dinner, dinner table and go, but would sell like a 14-inch gun with that? And then you'd go down into the hallway and out behind a plant pot. Would sir like a 14-inch gun with his plant pot? Would sir like a 14-inch gun in his bed? Would sir like a 14-inch gun on his roof? Would sir like a 14-inch gun in his... Go away! Um, was pretty much what the Admiral's T eventually said. Um, but yeah, so... so you know, Vickers' efforts to sell the 14-inch gun to the Royal Navy, um, spectacularly unsuccessful, although they did get some foreign sales out of it. Um... But yeah, so it was, I mean, when we had when you had things like um, the effort to shift from the World War One paradigm of destroyer design, as covered in the Interwar Destroyers video, um, you had Ambushcade and Amazon, which were basically kind of the Admiralty going, well, "We have this specification for a destroyer. What can you come up with that meets that?" Um, which resulted in two fairly different ships, actually, and that actually kind of answers. Some of your other questions, sh shipyards that specialise at building types of vessels, Thornycroft and Yarrow, they basically did destroyers. If you asked them to do something that wasn't a destroyer, it tended not to be terribly good. And if you asked other people to build destroyers, albeit with some exceptions, but generally they wouldn't quite be as good as the Thornycroft and Yarrow built ships. Um, earlier, is say in the pre-Dreadnought and Ironclad era there was a lot more kind of, well, we've got this design, do you want it? Um, or the Admiralty saying, well, we want a ship that is able to do this, and sometimes the specification should could simply be, we want a ship that's better than that one. 
from that one usually being some new foreign design, uh, at which point there'd be various tender submissions for various types of battleship um, or cruiser or whatever. Um, generally, the, the most influence was seen in the smaller ships because battleships being so key, the Admiralty was fairly keen to have a, a sort of a fairly firm hand on their design, but when it came to things like cruisers, there was a little bit more freedom um, of, of action going around, especially when you had things like the Ellswick cruisers um, giving rise to the protected cruiser. There was an awful lot of um, commercial shipyard influence on those ships' designs, apart from anything, because especially the Ellswick yards, they were kind of ahead of the game. Jack Andrew Hunter asks, which country's navy was best equipped to accomplish their objectives at their respective point of entry in World War II? In terms of their actual war objectives at the start of their entry into conflict, probably the Japanese, actually. Um, the German Admiralty was basically in a case of, but war? You you promised no war for, like, another three years. We, even our lively new Bismarcks aren't complete. Aww. Um, the Italians were in a case of, well, pretty much the same as the Germans, of, you you dragged us into a war before we were ready. Our our Latorios aren't ready, and our, our modernizations aren't finished. And um, help. The British, well, yeah, pretty much everyone in Europe was caught flat-footed by the the whole start of World War Two to a certain degree. The British were in the process of modernizing their fleet. They'd got the King George the Fifth in place. They were planning to bring in the Lions, and there was some talk about maybe what would eventually become Vanguard. And so they were left with a bunch of ships they'd really rather have decommissioned before a, a big war started and replaced with more modern units. Um, and that doesn't just apply to battleships. Uh, they had a bunch of cruisers, uh, sort of the C-class, D-class, E-class, which were left over from World War One, which, again, they would much rather have replaced with towns um, and the various 1938-1939 design cruisers that got subverted into being even more towns and derivatives. Um same with Shores, they still had a bunch of V&Ws while they were desperately trying to pump out the new sort of N and M class type and S class types. Um, so although the British Navy was positioned to accomplish its objectives simply through just being so much bigger than the Italian and German navies, which were even less prepared, um, they weren't certainly the best equipped at that point with a lot of old ships that they had to relegate to secondary duties. Um, the United States was in the process of a big build-up, but they hadn't quite hit critical mass yet, and they were stuck with a fair number of older sh older vessels. Um, in some ways, Pearl Harbor kind of did them a little bit of a favour in that it completely removed the option for mass battleship action entirely, which forced the US Navy to go down the carrier route. I mean, they were fairly heavily leaning towards the use of carriers anyway, but they were they were forced <laughs> to an extent to, to use carrier-only ops with minimal battleship escort, which probably worked out for the best for them in the end. Um, so yeah, that kind of by process of elimination that leaves the Japanese, because the Japanese had actually been thinking about this whole thing. Um, they'd pretty much got all the Congos ready, um, and... Yeah, I mean, if you look at what they were able to accomplish, a few embarrassing incidents like losing uh, some rather significant naval units to the Wake Island garrison, for example, aside, their initial objective of take over lots of islands in the Western Pacific very quickly um, and slaughter the local uh, naval defending units actually went fairly well. Um, so, yes... Between that and their air carrier, aircraft carrier force, they were probably the best equipped and set up to accomplish their objectives at the start of their entry into World War II. Obviously, that didn't last too long, but there it is. Christopher Dent asks, What would the complement of ship's boats be on a typical World War II-era battleship? What would the design and purpose of the various boats be? Now, as for the complement of ship's boats, <coughs> that varied wildly there is no one typical answer um that's partly because the older world war one era ships would tend to carry more because they'd been designed for it as compared to say the world war two era ships such as uh, the latorio seen here and well yeah try and find where you're going to stick a boat on that thing i mean they did have some but the increasing pro proliferation of uh, main deck level 
secondary and anti-aircraft batteries did kind of take away a lot of the space that had previously been used uh, for boats and obviously the fact that a lot of the immediately pre-war battleship designs also included um, facilities for aircraft further cut into that space. Then on top of that is the fact that ships' boats complements tended to diminish rather sharply during the war itself, bec partly because they needed more and more space for increasing numbers of anti-aircraft weapons, and partly because they realised, uh, I think as I mentioned pre in a previous video, that if you were ever likely to need them at sea, the because your ship was sinking, chances were your boats would probably have been turned into some rather dangerous splinters at the same time. Uh, they still would carry some, and the main purpose and design of these boats was effectively to act as little ferries to get people to and from shore. Um, this was obviously a lot more of an issue in earlier times when there was numerically a lot more ships and also port and harbour facilities were less developed, so ships would just tend to ride anchor and people would ferry back and forth. By the time of World War II, with fleets being smaller and harbours more advanced, generally ships would be able to come alongside to let people on and off. Um, but there was still occasion where they had to anchor out in the harbour and boats would be necessary to ferry people back and forth, which was at that point basically their main purpose. The, in earlier times they'd been used as picket craft, as towing craft, as landing craft and as general round utility vessels but most of that gone by the wayside with the advancements in technology um and yeah you you, you really didn't want to try and uh, be sailing around in a little tiny uh sort of 30 or 50 foot picket boat in the middle of a battle with battleships going around at 25 to 30 knots so yeah by the time of world war ii it was effectively message carrying and people carrying uh, taxi and ferry services when fleets were either going at low speed or at when they were at anchor in harbours. David Thornthwaite asks, In Nelson to Vanguard by D.K. Brown, he makes reference to a weapon called the B-bomb, which he describes in tests as devastating, with no effective protection being found. It's not clear why it wasn't developed further, especially given the preeminence of other British bomb designs like the Bouncing Bomb, Tall Boy and Grand Slam. Can you shed some light on this? Well, I couldn't easily find a picture of the B-bomb for love nor money, so here, have the picture of a Grand Slam instead. Um, it's always good for a laugh. Anyway, for those of you who are unaware, the B-bomb was a design of bomb, unsurprisingly enough, haha, um, come about in the 1930s. Now this actually used a fairly interesting idea which was drop the bomb ahead of the ship but make sure that the bomb is actually positively buoyant. The bomb then in theory floats back up underneath the ship, hits the ship and explodes under its keel. Now if that sounds like a familiar concept, well that is the concept that underlies most modern heavyweight torpedoes. It's incredibly devastating and almost impossible to protect against. And the biggest version of the B-bomb was a, uh, a £2,000 weapon. So if you want to give have some idea about just how nasty this is, um, go and look up uh, any one of the numerous videos uh, on YouTube of US Navy torpedo sink -Xs. Um Something And see, see what the effect of a Mark 48 ad cap exploding under the ship's keel has. The B-bomb would have carried an explosive warhead about twice that in its £2,000 form, um, in its £1,100 form about the same, and then there was a £250-er that obviously had slightly less. But yeah, that's going to be a pretty devastating weapon to be unleashing on ships in World War II. So the obvious question, as he asks, is, well, if it entered service in 1939, why was it never used operationally? That's two reasons. Um, I did have to do a fair bit of digging on this. One of them is accuracy, and that's to do with the method of operation, because, you see, the B-bomb had to hit the water hard enough and fast enough to dive deep enough so that when the, uh, the buoyancy overtook the inertia downwards, it would then pop back up again at a hard, fast enough speed to hit the enemy hull to detonate, but also um, for it to have gone deep enough to reach under the enemy ship's hull as and not just um, be ploughed over by the ship that was 
obviously going forward. That requires a fair bit of speed, which means it has to be dropped from a fair bit of height, and as most of you will be aware, level bombing in or dropping bombs from any significant height at any sort at the beginning of World War II was not the world's most accurate endeavour. Now, trying to judge, and, that, and that's against a, a fixed target, now trying to judge where exactly from a high altitude do I release this bomb against this moving target that is also trying to evade me in such a manner that it will land dead ahead of the target at a, at a re reasonable distance, then have enough velocity to go un under the water, pop back up, and hope the ship isn't evading whilst the bomb is doing all of this, and then strike it from the underside. <sighs> yeah, the, 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 the chances of actually scoring a direct hit in anything but the most exceptionally favourable circumstances were pretty slim, um, even if you were using multiple B-bombs, and that was one of the reasons why it wasn't ever really deployed operationally. The other thing was... It's a very situational weapon. Um, it's not that much good against a submarine or some other kind of small, fast target like a destroyer. Uh, it's really effective against cruisers and battleships, but bear in mind that a lot of early war patrol craft had limited payloads. If you're going to carry a weapon or a few weapons, you want to carry weapons that are as general purpose as possible. So rather than a bomb that is only applicable against very specific targets and requires an awful lot of luck, more luck than judgment, to be perfectly honest, to actually um, use successfully, it's much better to just carry depth charges or general purpose bombs or rockets or something of that nature, which you can pretty much use on anything that you happen to spot in the ocean. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a combination of... It's a very, very niche weapon, and at least in the early part of the war, the chances of actually getting an accurate drop are slim to none. By the mid to late war, there were um, bomb aiming systems and aircraft that probably could pull off that kind of thing. But by that point, you might as well just swarm the things with torpedo bombers and, and have done with it because that's much easier. Um, but yes, it, it was a case of a weapon that on paper and in trials worked absolutely brilliantly and could quite easily have sent almost any ship to the bottom with one or two hits, um, but in practice was rather less than useful. The biggest fear the Admiralty had, to be honest, was that somebody would come up with a similar idea and actually make it work, which, which they couldn't figure out how. Um, so, yeah, that you'll, you'll find this is generally the case with a lot of weird and wonderful experimental weapons the British come up with. Um, in the early to mid 20th century, they come up with some fantastic idea, works absolutely perfectly in trials, then they figure out uh, it's not actually that practical in the field. But given that we've proved the concept, someone else might make it work. Oh dear, we better start defending against that. Um, and then at some point in World War II, they just dropped all subtlety and went with stuff like this, which was, yeah, you know, stuff accuracy. We'll just hit the same postcode and you'll still be dead. So Long John asks, why did the Japanese for the most part keep the Moyoko class for defending the East Indies whilst much weaker heavy cruisers were slogging it out around the Solomons? Well, the simple answer to this is that they didn't. They were actually quite active. Yes, they started off in the East Indies, um, but Miyoko and Higuro were both active in the sort of the classic Pacific operational area. Um, they were around for the Coral Sea, and Miyoko was also around for Midway, and was actually there at the Solomon Islands as well. Um, Nachi and Ashigara were assigned after the East Indies area had calmed down a bit more to the northern waters, um, but there was still U.S. Navy activity. There was still U.S. Navy activity around in that area. Um, for example, the Battle of the Komondorsky Islands uh, with USS Salt Lake City uh, that involved one of the class. So, yeah, they, w they were around and they were being used in um, the more active theatres. It's just that initially they were active in the East Dutch East Indies, but they did get moved around into other operational areas fairly quickly. Luce the Lynx asks, How did the advent of true smokeless powder affect how the various navies planned their ships and engagements? And were most major navies quick to adopt the newly developed powder? 
Well, firstly, there's no such thing as true smokeless powder. Um, take a look at this. This is uh, pretty much one of the latest, as in most recent photos of a battleship firing its guns that you'll be able to find. And uh, yeah, does that look smokeless to you? So yeah, when they say smokeless, at the level of battleship guns, what they actually really mean is reduced smoke. Now, fair enough, that is a fairly substantial reduction, as opposed to the old black powder charges, which were fire guns, instant smoke screen, everyone might as well sit down and have a cup of tea, because nobody can see what the heck is on either side of that cloud of smoke for a, a good five or six minutes. Um, so yeah. How did it affect ships and engagement? Um, Quite significantly, actually, because the reduced amount of smoke meant that it was now possible to fire your heavy guns relatively quickly. Whilst it wasn't the only thing that held back the development of quicker firing heavy guns, the simple fact of the matter was that with the old black powder charges, there simply wasn't that much of an incentive to develop heavy guns that could fire more than once every three to five minutes or longer because simply put it wouldn't matter if you did have such a gun because you wouldn't be able to see anything um, unless you were charging through your own gun smoke at which point you actually would, would be blinding yourself a little bit longer than you'd be hiding yourself from the enemy so it meant that one of the major obstacles to developing a quicker firing main battery gun and therefore also deploying more and larger guns was removed because if you look at something like say the HMS Victoria or HMS Camperdown and a lot of other sort of uh, turret ships of that period aside from maybe a tiny handful of small guns for suppressing colonials and natives and the odd uh, small craft they're basically platforms for their heavy artillery because well if you once you fire that yeah, you can't fire your heavy artillery because you can't see, you can't fire any other artillery because you can't really see, at which point only guns that have some application inside the massive clouds of black smoke you've just created are worth having. So with the dissipating smoke, it then, whilst people worked on trying to make the heavier guns fire faster and faster, it then started to make sense to have secondary and tertiary batteries of quicker firing lesser guns because you could actually see to shoot and having all of those extra guns wouldn't just contribute to a massive black pool that would render you completely invisible in the first minute or two of firing. So it actually changed ship design, or contributed to a change in ship design quite significantly, which of course led to changes in how people thought engagements would go. Now as far as quick to adopt, navies were very quick to adopt. They saw the advantage advantages in it they saw the disadvantages of letting their enemies have it when they didn't have it um, so the take up of various forms of smokeless or reduced smoke propellant um, was incredibly quick within about a decade pretty much everybody had gone uh, over to that method of, of firing Corridan asks what benefits or drawbacks would a trimaran hull like the independence class little combat ships have for a dreadnought battleship and were there any paper designs that considered them I'm not aware of any trimaran dreadnought designs from the sort of 1906 through 1950 period. Um, I could be wrong, I accept there were some very crazy designs floating out there, but I don't believe that any trimaran designs entered the equation. Um, <clears throat> in terms of benefits or drawbacks, well, the main problem with a trimaran design for a battleship specifically is that for a given displacement, your central hull is smaller. For obvious reasons, because if you're going for a fixed amount of displacement, which is especially important in the Treaty Era, that displacement is going to have to be spread out amongst all three of your hulls. That, in turn, limits space for machinery and, more importantly, for weaponry, uh, because things like... Uh, turrets and barbettes have a fixed diameter that you can't reduce um, unless you want to go down to twin turrets or single turrets which to be honest is a little bit silly um, when you can have triples and quads so you yeah if you're if you're working to a specific displacement your central hull being smaller limits the size of weaponry you can deploy and with a classic trimaran layout like it used on the independence class those side pontoons are not going to be anywhere near big enough to mount anything of any particular size. 
Granted, if somebody had been mad enough to come up with an 1890s trimer and pre dreadnought, you could probably argue that the pontoons might make nice mounting points for your casement mounted tertiary or possibly secondary weaponry, um, depending on what particular era of pre dreadnought you're in. Um, but again, limitations on hull size, limitations on machinery. Um, limitations on crew accommodation, etc., etc. The main advantage of trimarans these days, and obviously, as you can see, is especially used on the uh, on the independence class, is vastly increased deck space. Now, with that increased deck space, obviously, these days they can use helicopters and such. Um, back in the day, not so much. The only real benefit that I can see in immediate terms for a trimaran hull capital ship would be one that in the event of combat in theory having these pontoons would mean that they could physically take the damage from incoming enemy shells and or torpedoes without compromising your main hull and therefore protecting your main hull for at least a considerable portion of your ship's length which could have its advantages assuming that you had some kind of probably explosive based breakaway system that would allow you to ditch a pontoon that was now uh foot had a negative buoyancy and was dragging you down um and you just have to hope that you've built your central hull stable enough to remain upright with either one pontoon or no pontoons that does run into of course the, the problem that with the more limited armament you're more likely to be in a position where you need to drop a pontoon um, a bit like a star lord lizard um in the first place which so yeah swings and roundabouts on that the only other questionable benefit would be in the sort of mid to late world war ii era when it became very rapidly clear that ships needed as much anti-aircraft armament as possible for similar reasons as the independence class having the that massive helicopter deck space you could just cover that deck space with anti-aircraft guns um yeah sort of imagine some kind of weird trimaran iowa maybe if they just maybe if they literally just took some industrial girders and strapped a couple of atlantas to each side um without the command superstructure and then plated over the intervening space you could fit an awful lot of 20 and 40 mil on there quite where you'd put the crew for it i don't entirely know but it's a theoretical possibility, at least for short distances. Um, but yes, basically the, the the possible benefits are either counterbalanced or outweighed by the disadvantages inherent to the benefit you'd be gaining, or else are pretty niche. So yeah, um, for a battleship where you need a lot of powerful machinery concentrated in one space, a lot of heavy armor concentrated in one space, and some very big guns for which you need a fairly substantial hull, Trimaran's probably one of the worst designs you can pick for that particular niche. Bryce McDonald asks, were there any consequences or punishments if a nation exceeded the limits of the Washington and London Naval Treaties? Why did each subsequent treaty keep tightening restrictions on gun size and tonnage of non-capital ships? And what country was hurt the most by this and which one was helped the most? Oh, this is a, uh, a real doozy of one. Right, so which one was hurt the most and which was helped? In some ways, both of the answers actually are potentially answers to both of the questions in that aspect. Um, in absolute terms, the country that was hurt the most by this was, compared to its previous standing, the Royal Navy, i.e. the UK, the British Empire, because it went from being the largest navy in the world with an aim to be effectively have a two-power standard, um, to having to accept equality with the United States of America. So it going from where it was to where it now was going to have to be, it was hurt the most by it. On the other hand, Britain was a little bit broke after World War One, and although in pure financial terms they could have afforded to build the G3s and the N3s, there's no way um, Britain could have afforded a massive arms race with both America and Japan going all the way through the 1920s and into the 30s and the alternatives were to let America take a massive industrial lead so in other ways 
Britain was helped the most by it because it got to keep its position just about as a preeminent uh, naval power, even if it had to share that spot now, without having to get into a ruinously bad arms race. The flip side um, was Japan, in that they certainly felt they felt that they'd been hurt the most because they felt their pride had been hurt. They felt that their ambitions to have a navy that would be able to challenge the other great powers had been strangled in its crib. And they felt very hard done by and betrayed by the fact that they were effectively going to be the world's sort of either second or third largest. They were going to occupy basically world number two or three spots, depending on whether you count Britain and America as joint first or or first and second interchangeably um but anyway so they they were not on on the top tier and that they viewed that as a great insult and a hurt but at the same time kind of similar to the uk but perhaps even worse if the british empire couldn't afford a naval arms race with the united states there's no way the japanese could you look at the amount of the japanese gross domestic product they were spending on their navy by the time the washington naval treaty called time out on all that yeah, if you think the uh, if you think the recession of the early early twenty tens was bad, just ask an economist who knows something about history what Japan's economy would have looked like if they'd kept trying to keep up with an unconstrained Britain and America in in a naval arms race through the twenties and thirties. Now, in terms of consequences or punishments, well, to be honest, the main consequence was if you break the treaty, then everybody else will be allowed to break the treaty. And given that the entire thing had been brought about by all the countries agreeing that the hypothetical and developing naval arms race was just ruinously expensive for all of them, it would effectively the consequence dash punishment was, well, if you want to break the naval treaty, you are effectively shooting your own economy in the head. So have fun with that. Um, I mean, apart from anything else, to be honest, if it, 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 to a certain degree, it was kind of working out of self-interest and the honor system because... How exactly do you enforce a punishment on the British Empire or the United States of America in the 1920s and 30s? They'll just turn around with the ships that they have, let alone the ones they're building, and blow you clean off the face of the planet. Um, eh, it was a simpler time back then. Anyway, um, why they kept tightening restrictions on gun size and tonnage um, of non-capital ships? Basically because people kept cheating. Um, the original Washington Treaty had restrictions on cruisers, but it didn't have restrictions on submarines. Um, and so, and the restrictions on cruisers were fairly vague. So all of a sudden you had loads of what we would later call heavy cruisers being designed. And on, and then people were like, ah, yes, well, if we're limited on the amount of cruisers we can have by tonnage. And then you had the French coming up with things like Surcouf and the British coming up with the M series. And there was a whole swathe of other um, eight inch and bigger armed submarines in the works. The US had some designs for even an armored one, which I've shown before. Um, and the French wanted to do more developments on Surcouf. The British similarly had uh, cru sort of cruiser submarines with five inch and 5.25 inch guns on them. Yeah, everyone was horribly rules lawyering the Washington Naval Treaty because, well, if we can't have cruisers but we can have submarines then we'll make cruisers that we'll make submarines that are like cruisers but because they are submarines they don't count towards the limit and basically the london naval treaty was a case of between that and everything else just people sitting down going yeah okay we see what you're doing stop it we're actually going to change the rules now um so yeah hopefully that answers that veen ve asks what was the general attitude among men and officers of the French Navy toward the Royal Navy during and after the Napoleonic Wars? Uh, during, did they go into battles like, say, the Nile or Trafalgar fully expecting to win? And after, how long did it take them to generally admit that, yes, Britain really did rule the waves and the French were now a bit of a second-rate power navally? So attitudes varied, to be honest, ship to ship, region to region, fleet to fleet. Um, in the immediate run up to the Napoleonic Wars I before before the French Revolution. It was actually generally pretty cordial, um because the social classing and hierarchy on both sides was pretty similar. During the Napoleonic Wars, especially in the earlier part of the revolutionary period when um 
pretty much the bulk of France's competent naval officer corps either got executed or had to run away. And you got a lot of political and ideological appointees. It got a little, well, I'd say a little bit sour. It got very sour in certain cases. Um, but as more professional seamen and fewer political appointees started to percolate their way up the ranks, um, things kind of went back to being relatively cordial. Things were a little bit more aggressive, um, at least initially, but... To be perfectly honest, of all the various armed services, as I've kind of indicated at points before, with the sea as a common enemy, it's generally very difficult outside of really weird radical ideological cultures like World War II Japan to find an environment where sailors on either side have a particular antipathy towards each other once the actual fighting is done. Um... So, yeah, it wasn't too bad outside of a few flare-ups. In terms of when they went into battles like the Nile or Trafalgar fully expecting to win, depends on the time. Initially, again, initially going into it, they were coming off of uh, sort of the Royalist era where France had generally in the past few decades got the worst of it, but they would also put up some pretty good fights and scored victories. So initially they thought, oh, with our new superior revolutionary system, etc., etc., we will clearly win. Um, and kind of like with destroyers in World War II, frigates and such like tended to attract the most uh, sort of brave, dashing, and radical of the officers and captains. So um, that was borne out to a greater extent there than it perhaps was in the fleet actions. As the Napoleonic Wars ground on and more and more naval battles were carried wholesale by the British with relatively minimal losses, morale to a certain degree began to collapse. Um, and you can you can see elements of that at the Nile in as much as the French had... I mean, fair enough, they were also protecting an army, so they didn't have particularly great incentive to put themselves out in harm's way, but at the Nile the French basically turtled up um, and planned to fight a complete defensive battle in range of their shore batteries. Now, fair enough, that is a uh, reasonable military decision, but it also reflects a uh, somewhat um, conservative way of thinking about your chances in a fight. But the French still fought very bravely and very hard at the Nile and at Trafalgar, but by the time you got to Trafalgar, um, morale had taken a serious nosedive and there weren't that many people in the French fleet but at Trafalgar who were seriously convinced that they could win, um, especially given Villeneuve had done his absolute level best to avoid Nelson for about, about up to two years at that point. Um, and when they saw the Royal Navy coming for them that morning on the 5th of October 1805, they pretty much knew what was about to happen. They weren't going to sell their lives cheaply, and they did their best, but the general feeling you get from accounts at the time was that, yeah, as Nelson's columns began to break through the French fleet, a lot of the French crews knew they were fighting the inevitable. Um, and that just sort of continued further down through 1805 through, to eight, through eight, 1815, albeit that, as I said, with the smaller ships, a much higher uh, level of morale and esprit was actually maintained for considerably longer. Now, in terms of after, how long did it take them to admit that Britain was the top dog? Um, <laughs> they generally didn't, basically. Um, not, yeah, pretty much not until the end of the 19th century. They knew that they couldn't outbuild the British, although they gave it a couple of good tries. But when they realised they couldn't physically outbuild the British most of the time, they spent most of the 19th century trying to be a little bit more sneaky and come up with ways of uh, basically coming up with force multipliers. So this is why a lot of the innovations in the, uh, sort of, should we say, sort of first, the, the 1815 to 1860, 1865-ish, were mostly made by French 
ship designers because they were looking for some way of making their ships individually better than the Royal Navy's because they knew, they, as I said, they, they knew they couldn't win a building war, but they thought maybe if if we can only build ten ships for the, every fifteen that the Royal Navy build, if our ten, if each of our ten ships can take on two British ships, then we might actually win. So this is why you think see things like Napoleon and Gloire coming out ahead of their British responses um, and equivalents and why you also see things like the centre battery ironclad mostly shows up in um, French hands the two decker gun gun deck ironclad shows up in French hands it's only towards the uh, latter third I'd say of the 19th century when they get a little bit distracted by a small thing called the uh, Franco-Prussian war uh, and such that and the fact that technology then starts to march away very quickly, they kind of start to realise that there's n- there's very little chance of them staying on a par with Britain navally. You have a kind of a more the the more extreme methods of trying to come up with some kind of killer um, way of doing things still sharp at that point. That's why you have the Jeune Ecole, where everybody's thinking about using torpedo boats and cruisers instead because they they know flat out they can't keep up with battleships that goes by the wayside and uh then yeah as we said in the pre as we saw in the pre-dreadnought video they kind of just kind of muddle along trying to come up with something and pretty much generally acknowledging they're now very firmly to second tier naval power but it takes an awful lot of time (laughs) for them to admit that and to be fair um you could say the french probably drove technological innovation in the 19th century just as much if not more than the british for a considerable portion of it because they were the ones who were constantly pushing the envelope and forcing the british to adapt and overcome george armatus asks was the dreadnought built too early some of jackie fisher's enemies in the navy argued that building the dreadnought made all their old ships obsolete so in the naval race great britain was only one ship ahead of germany should the royal navy have just kept producing peru dreadnoughts until germany innovated and then use their industrial might to build more and better dreadnoughts like with gloire and hms warrior i would say in this case fisher was probably right the main thing with the Gloire Warrior situation was that British industry was so far ahead of French industry in most respects when it came to that kind of shipbuilding, um, both in terms of technology and in speed, that any window of superiority created by, by Gloire was relatively fleeting um, because as with happened with Warrior, the British could get wind of it, get their own superior design, designed, ordered, and in production before Gloire even finished, which meant that with the size of the fleets obviously being quite large, it meant that although Gloire individually was a problem, it, they couldn't, French couldn't come up with them in numbers enough to uh, tip the balance before things like Warrior and Black Prince started arriving on the scene. Um, Whereas if you're talking about pre-dreadnought to dreadnought, um, the margin of superiority on a properly done dreadnought that combines things like turbine engines, modern fire control, all big gun armament, etc., etc., uh, that we've all discussed before, that's such a big game changer and ships take much longer to build and British technology was not ahead of everybody else's to anything like the same degree that it was at the time of the Warrior Gloire uh, sort of building race. And obviously in certain areas you could even, you can actually say that in some cases British uh, technology was a little bit behind other people's technology. Um, it was very much a neck and neck race in, in naval naval ter- tech wise in the early 1900s and 1910s with various countries pulling ahead in different aspects of it. So all of that meant that as far as well, as far as I can see, anyway, Britain did have some advantages in terms of things like turbine engines um, and the early fire control tables. So it made sense at that point. And bear in mind that it wasn't just a case of waiting for Germany to invade. Germany was actually quite late to the dreadnought um, part of things. It, the Americans had already laid down USS South Carolina. That was being built. I mean, okay, fair enough. It's not exactly the world's best first generation dreadnought. It's also not the worst, um, but it was a major game changer, and people people knew it was being built. So 
and the Japanese were also going with the Satsumas. So that change was happening anyway. The fact that Dreadnought was the first wasn't because it was the first laid down. It was basically because Jackie Fisher turned the dockyard into overdrive mode 24-7 um, and stole gun turrets from other, other ships to get Dreadnought out into the water and in service, even though it had been started construction later on. So you could argue, in a way, they had done what uh, HMS Warrior had done to Gloire in as much as they'd waited for someone to innovate and then steamroll at them. Um, using the might of British shipbuilding. Um, but at the same time, obviously, the, the primary enemy, uh, at the time being Germany, uh, hadn't taken that step yet. Well, then this is a, this is the thing with a multipolar world, whereas uh, earlier on it had basically been Britain, then France, and then hundreds and hundreds of places further down the list, everybody else, uh, when you're talking about the 18th and most of the 19th centuries. But anyway... Um, the other thing was, by getting Dreadnought into service first, um, especially with all those technological advances, they could then get operational experience with it and go, right, okay, we know this works, we know this doesn't work, what do we need to change? Obviously, one of the most important things being, don't put your main mast right behind the funnel. Stupid people. Anyway, um, that should that should that much should have been obvious to any first year naval architect. But anyway, enough said about that. Um, by getting all that early operational experience ahead of anyone else, it meant that they could then churn out their next class of dreadnought and the next one after that, around the time that everyone else was either completing or starting their first dreadnoughts. And of course, the British B were being a little bit cagey about the lessons they'd learned. Then were effectively well for the price of building one effectively prototype vessel. Once everyone else starts coming out with their dreadnoughts, we can build more dreadnoughts than them at the same time as them, which gives us a numerical advantage anyway. And then, at least in theory, we can also build qualitatively better dreadnoughts because we have learned the lesson from the first one and all of them are learning their all their lessons and making all the mistakes we made a few years ago with their first classes of ship, at which case we have an advantage and then we've run away with that kind of like we did with the ironclad era kind of worked in some ways not so much in others um but it was certainly a legitimate approach and i hope that explanation provides uh some reasoning as to why i think fisher was probably more right than wrong to pull the trigger on dreadnought when he did matthew zeisel asks since it seems like we're already on the topic of pre-dreadnoughts which of the last generation of pre-dreadnought classes um connecticut lord nelson deutschland danton etc do you think would have been the most capable i.e least of a hindrance into combat operations um when operating alongside dreadnoughts if the need for one of them to fill a gap in the battle line arose so the main disadvantage here is going to be speed uh because they're all 18 to 19 knot ships and as we said much earlier um in another question it's not good enough for battle line that's got 20 not, 21 knot top speed. With that said, let's go through them. I'm going to fairly quickly rule out the Connecticut class, um, and that's purely based on the fact that it has an 8 inch and a 7 inch battery. So it's got, it's got its, obviously they all have their 4 12 inch, or in the case of the other Germans, 11 inch, because they like to be different and special, but with the American Connecticut class, those eight eight inch guns and twelve seven inch guns just no that's that exemplifies one of the worst um aspects of mixed battery firing. You're gonna have an awful time trying to figure out which which of those shells are which um and outside of that armor speed main armor wise there's not a lot to distinguish the Connecticut's from anybody else so um purely on the grounds of having an incredibly confusing uh, secondary tertiary battery, I'd rule the Connecticut's out. Now, if you look at the Lord Nelsons, I mean, everyone's got the same, pretty much the same, as makes no different vein armament apart from the Deutschlands, as I said, but, um, so we'll ignore that. Nelsons, triple expansion engines, 18 knots, they're not going to keep that up for very long. Um, slightly, sort of, moving towards the top of the line uh, when it comes to armour. They've got a 12-inch belt, which puts them in a competitive environment with actual line battleships, or dreadnought, early dreadnought battleships, so that's 
quite good. Um, they've got quite the extensive secondary battery of 9.2 inch guns, which have some capability at short range of actually doing some pretty nasty damage. Um, so, yeah, that's good. <coughs> um, they'd be relatively solid choices if it wasn't for the fact that that 18 knot speed and triple expansion steam engines basically means that they're going to be even slower than that 18 knots for any considerable time which means they're going to be massive uh ball and chains on the ankles of a battle fleet um so yeah it's and there is also you can make an argument that the 9.2 inch guns may suffer from being just too small to be really effective against dreadnoughts and just too large to be easily distinguishable from the 12 inch guns so you could make a similar argument to why i ruled out the connecticut's albeit you only have two sizes of shell in splash instead of three to work out from so the neither here nor there the deutschlands um also rule out pretty quickly um i mean they're they're the worst armored uh, which is a bit weird when you think about German ships of World War One, but they are the worst armoured of three of the four, sorry, pre dreadnought classes we're looking at. Nine point four inches of armour. They've got the eleven inch guns. Okay, fair enough. Other German capital ships in the dreadnought era have eleven inch guns, but let's face it, the eleven inch guns aren't that brilliant. Um there's obviously all this stuff about oh they had the same penetration and destructive capabilities as British twelve inch guns. No, they didn't. The mathematics is there to prove it. Um, now, on 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 the positive side, they do have a um, um, single secondary battery um, of 6.7 inch guns. Their tertiary is 3.5 inch guns. They're very unlikely to mix those up, and they're very unlikely to mix those up with the main guns. 18.5 knots, okay, slightly faster than the Nelsons and Lord Nelsons and the Connecticut's, but again, triple expansion engines, so they're not going to keep that up for very long um yeah and to be perfectly honest you can see how that all worked out at jutland um they weren't able to as again as we mentioned before they weren't able to keep up with uh even in battle against battle cruisers uh Pomern just went kaboom when it got hit so yeah i'm going to rule those out they're, they're too lightly protected and well, oh, they're pre-dreadnoughts now believe it or not that actually leaves the winner as the dantons the French, uh, and for all the ribbing I give French pre-dreadnoughts, the Dantons, as I mentioned in the uh, French pre-dreadnought video, are actually not too bad. They just happen to unfortunately suffer from the fact that they were completed well after everyone else had dreadnoughts in service, which kind of made them instantly obsolete. But if you're going to have to take a pre-dreadnought into battle, um, that fact that they are also a, a few years later down the line means that their capabilities are actually the least worst. I mean, they're they're 19 knots anyway, so they're already the fastest of the ones we're considering, so their their ball and chain effect on the rest of the fleet is less. Also, they're turbine-powered, which means they can keep that speed up for much longer compared to the other three classes with their vertical triple expansion engines. Um, their 240mm secondary battery kind of like the Lord Nelsons, could actually be effective at close close to medium range. Um, obviously, it's not going to be as good as a unified main battery, but it could work So, um, in, in a close-range firefight. So, great, fine, fantastic. Belt arm is not fantastic, to be perfectly fair. 9.8 inches. They, they are going to take a pummeling, um, but really, these classes are divided into two of... You've got the Lord Nelsons and the Connecticut's who can probably take a, a fair few body blows in trading shell fire. And then you have the Deutschlands and the Dantons, which probably can't. Um, but for me, it comes down to the fact that where you, when you look at the speed, armor, and firepower thing, everyone else loses out on the speed because they don't have turbines. Um, the Connecticut's lose out on the firepower because of that six, that seven and eight inch mixed secondary battery. Um, the Deutschlands, as we covered, they have a uh, they have a light battery, so you're not going to get the confusion issue. But it's it is light at which point there you're left with effectively four eleven inch guns as your anti battleship weaponry is not that brilliant. Um, so that 
kind of by, almost by default winds it over to Danton and Lord Nelson. Um, armament wise, between Danton and Lord Nelson, it's pretty much a flush. You can make a certain amount of argument that the 240s are maybe a little bit more capable than the 9.2s, but it's not really that much of an, an odds there. Um, so the firepower part is equal. The speed part, the Danton wins handily. And the belt armor part, fair enough, the Lord Nelson wins that part. But ultimately, these are pre dreadnoughts. They're not going to be winning fight gunfights with dreadnoughts anyway, unless they gang up in numbers. And also, there's more Dantons. So, yes, unlikely as it may sound, uh, but given that it is a French dreadnought and it's me speaking, it's naval history. It's ma in, to a certain degree, when it comes to this kind of thing, it's a matter of mathematics. Maths doesn't lie, um, except when crews are completely stupid which means that I can't really call myself any kind of serious historian and not say if I'm given a choice of those four and told I have to wander into Dreadnought Battle Line, I'm probably going to take the Dantons. Um, so go France. Vive la France. Dave Collier asks, Admiral Ernest J. King was famous for not exactly being a fan of the British in general and the Royal Navy in particular. Was his antipathy triggered by an incident or incidents, or was he just like that? So, yes, Admiral King, the man descri once described as the most even-tempered man in the entire U.S. Navy because he was permanently in a furious rage. Um, <laughs> Admiral King doesn't... I think someone described him as... He basically hated everyone, um, to a certain degree. He just really hated the British more. I mean, think of that thing from that uh, quote from 1984. All animals are equal and some are more, more equal than others. Admiral King was, I hate everyone, but I hate the British more than others. Um, so, yeah. Um, as far as anyone can tell, from what I've been able to find, his particular hatred towards the British seems to have grown out of something, no one can really pin down what, but something that happened, or maybe multiple things that happened during World War I when he was um, actually over um, serving with the US Navy elements that came over to assist the Royal Navy towards the latter part of the First World War. Quite what it was that triggered that off? I say no one knows, but it seemed to build and build and build until um, by the start of World War II, he really, really didn't like the British. Um, to the point that it can actually well be argued he actually ended up costing many Allied servicemen's lives because purely of his instinctual hatred of the British, he refused to listen to anything they wanted. They had to say when it came to U-boat warfare once America entered the war, albeit that he had his own ideas about how to attack U-boats. And as a result, that's when you got an awful lot of Allied shipping with an awful lot of people on board going down off the American coast. Um, so, yeah. I mean, th there are certain aspects of what of his comments on the British that are probably fair late in the sort of the mid part of the war. Um, but it's kind of like a broken clock being right twice a day. Um, if you, let's face it, the British were not perfect by a long shot in World War Two. So if you've got someone who's constantly griping and sniping and pointing out ev that they're wrong all the time, inevitably they're going to make mistakes, which is going to, by default, make him right. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, he he just appears to have been a a generally angry and aggressive person who seemed to make enemies everywhere he went, but reserved a particular antipathy for the British for some reason. Matt Blom asks, which capital ship underwent the most successful major rebuild? I think I've answered this relatively recently in a dry dock, um, so I'll try and summarise quickly here. There's simply the fact that you have to quantify what you mean by most successful. Um, I mean, you could look at something like, say, Warspite, and say, right, well, Warspite had a massive major rebuild, as a result of which it was able to achieve an awful lot and survive an awful lot during the Second World War. Therefore, it has a good good um, qualification. At the same time, you could actually say the same thing about HMS Renown. Okay, fair enough, HMS Renown doesn't quite get the same mimetic values as Warspite, albeit that some of Warspite's value comes from the First World War, which Renown kind of missed by mostly by not existing until pretty much near the end of it. Um, but Renown was also, especially compared to its poor old sister ship Repulse, 
Renown had a very useful career um, exploiting the fact its rebuild to fairly good effect. At the same time, you've got the various Italian um, rebuilds. Now, whilst individually things like Giulio Cesare and Andrea Doria didn't achieve that much, which is kind of the success, the sort of battlefield campaign successes that you can attribute to people, things like Renown and uh, Warspite. The flip side is that when you look at something like the Italian battleships, they started from a lot worse position and they went through a massive rebuild that actually brought them out to be viable combat units um, and sort of the backbone of the Italian Navy until the Littorios could come out. That in and of itself is a major accomplishment and it's pretty much the thing that kept the Mediterranean from becoming an allied lake in the early part of the war because um, older or sh older bat refitted ships or not, they couldn't just be ignored. Um, so although they didn't have as anywhere near as much battlefield success in terms of their intrinsic effects and the technical achievement of turning ultimately what was sort of a, a set of second generation dreadnoughts as opposed to second generation super dreadnoughts into something that actually counted as a viable combat unit in the second world war goes you can make a good argument for them and then of course you've got things like the congos radically changing their capabilities um albeit keeping some of their major flaws and then mostly getting sunk which is um kind of a downside um but again the the, the technological um, achievement of turning the Congos into what they were in the Second World War is again something that is could be rated as highly successful. Um, and then, of course, um, sort of coming in almost in lo in last place chronologically, not necessarily capability wise, but chronologically, is what the Americans turned a bunch of the standard battleships that they dug up from Pearl Harbor into. Um, now, in a way, in some ways, that's kind of cheating because, well. That rebuild was done a heck of a lot later, which then means that the actual capabilities of the ship are going to be significantly greater because obviously they're being refitted with much newer technology, radar, fire control systems, 5-inch 38 calibre uh, mounts, etc, etc. But still, the lethality improvements of those cannot be underestimated in any way, shape or form. And well, look what they did to the Japanese at Surigao Strait, for example. Um, Granted, not a lot could be done with their speed, but hey, that's the standards for you. Um, so yeah, in terms of overall absolute lethality and overall modernization, it's got to be one of those, probably one of the Colorados, maybe West Virginia um, is as good a candidate as any, probably better than most. So yeah, you can probably make an argument for any of those ships that I listed, depending on how you define success. And that brings us to the end of our second hour in this Patreon Dry Dock Q&A, if you can believe it. Um, well, <laughs> on to the third hour. Uh, uh, let me see, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten questions. So, yes, yeah, definitely a third hour, but hopefully we should wrap that up at some point in the next hour. Um, yeah, this is going to be fun, isn't it?